Can anything be more brutal than the boys on Amazon? Yeah, of course, it's based on a Garth Ennis comic book. Cynical, satirical takes on the superhero genre aren't a new thing. Creators have been asking who watches The Watchmen for decades. But then, Garth Ennis in his immutable style has managed to turn that take into a grim world of depravity, violence, and brutality. The Amazon series has done its best to translate that into the show, but in the pages of The Boys, everyone's dark side has an even darker side. Just how dark? Glad you asked. You did ask, right? I mean, I can't actually hear you. Yeah, you know how this works. Go ahead. Release it. It probably comes as no surprise that the creator of a series like The Preacher, where a Texas preacher with a rough past gains the voice of God and teams up with an Irish vampire to hunt God down and give it back, that even Ennis' protagonists are troubled, to say the least. So, even though the soups that the boys fight are irredeemable horrors that dole out their depravity without fear of consequences, the guy tasked with creating those consequences might just be as bad. Ennis based Butcher on Marvel's The Punisher, a character Ennis had written for previously by having him kill the entire Marvel Universe. So that, but more. So far in the show, Butcher's need to enact his revenge on soups has taken its toll on the team. In the comic books, he takes it so much further where young Ryan is a subject of contention, being the child of Butcher's wife and a homelander not concerned with consent. In the comics, the child actually erased Butcher's wife by laser-eyeing itself out of the womb, and Butcher quickly returned the favor. Really, that's only the beginning. The whole video could be a catalog of Butcher just being awful. When Ennis says he doesn't like heroes, he means it. Fans know that the boys end with Butcher turning on the boys in his attempt to release a chemical that will kill anyone with Compound V in their system. Will live-action Butcher end up going that far? Time will tell. What makes anyone put up with the clearly awful things that Butcher gets up to is the reality that there's a nearly invincible soup out there that is the absolute worst. What do you do if you have nearly immeasurable power and you weren't raised by a kindly Kansas couple that taught him to respect the power that he has and have empathy for the powerless? You get to see what Zack from Saved by the Bell would be like with superpowers. A complete nightmare. Whatever your twisted mind desires. In the comics or in the series, the only thing that holds Homelander in check is his nearly pathological need to be liked, but that has its limits. The closer he gets to those limits, the worse things get for everyone else. In the series, Starlight had a traumatizing encounter with the Deep that sent the Deep on a spiritual quest to earn his way back on the team. In the comic, that took the form of an initiation ritual performed by Homelander himself, as well as Black Noir and A-Train. One of his more notorious comic book moments is not with the boys or any other soups, but a family from New York called the Mullers who, through the religious organization Believe, had won a dinner with Homelander. Instead, Homelander takes the family's car with the family in it, into the sky, gave his unfavorable review of religion, and then to drive the point home that he's the only man in the sky, he drops the car, family and all. Just to get out of dinner plans. Like Butcher, Homelander could be heading towards an extra brutal endgame, in his case, killing the vice president. For as frightening as Homelander is, he is in some ways at least predictable, in that he is motivated by his own ego and subject to his own whims. But there's another member of the Seven that manages to be all the way more terrifying for how little is known about him, the menacing Black Noir. If you change languages halfway through and you can hide that you're giving the character essentially the same name twice. Black Noir has been the silent enforcer, and the only other being that at the very least unsettles Homelander. In the Diabolical Companion series, the only animated short connected to the series showed Noir teaching Homelander how the Seven covers for their mistakes. His attack on the boys was particularly brutal, but he did spare a young child, indicating that he has some sort of code. In the comics, that code is, kids make good snacks, at least when he's trying to frame Homelander. While that storyline has been dropped for the series, in the comics Black Noir is actually a clone of Homelander and Vought's failsafe should Homelander go too far off the rails. Unfortunately for, well, everybody, he grows tired of being the understudy, waiting for one of the horrible things Homelander does to be enough. So he does a raft of horrible things as Homelander to frame his other self. Which includes eating a baby, which really is hard to beat when it comes to vile things. In the series, the boys picks up with a Queen Maeve who has begun to check out, jaded by her superhero life and losing interest in the lie of Vought and the Seven. Live action Maeve is tortured by her growing disenchantment with the superhero life, and quietly plotting her own revenge against the subject of her hate, her former romantic partner Homelander. In the comics, she's not so much tortured by it as much as it has completely defeated her. Live action Maeve might be faking her alcoholism so that she'll be underestimated when she's prepared to take on Homelander, but comic book Maeve is all the way in the bag. When she finds out about Starlight's awful initiation, she not only doesn't offer any empathy, she tells the new recruit to leave her alone in the rudest manner possible. 
Just like her live action counterpart, she does eventually try to do the right thing in her own way. In the series, she was able to subdue Black Noir by taking advantage of his nut allergy, allowing Starlight to escape. In the comics, she hucks Starlight to safety and unsuccessfully takes on Homelander to give the fellow hero a chance to escape. So it's not all bad, just mostly. To say that the boys are outgunned when it comes to soups would be a bit of an understatement. It's part of the reason that Butcher has to rely so much on blackmail to keep the bad good guys in check. Aside from their own temporary doses of Compound V used to even the scales a bit, the boys have a secret weapon who is not a boy. She's the female of the species, otherwise known as the female, or in the series, Kamiko. In the show, Kamiko is the product of experimenting with adult exposure to the Compound V, and while experimented on, she was separated from her brother. In the comics, her father dropped her in a vat of a version of Compound V as a baby and turned into a superpowered murder machine. While live action Kamiko is disturbed by the level of violence she is capable of, comic book female who has no other name rather lives for it. So much so, in fact, that when she's not being drafted by the boys for a little ultra violence, she hires her skills out to the American Mafia as a hit woman. In fact, the only one she seems to not harbor at least some degree of murderous intent for is Frenchie, as long as he doesn't touch her. She's not a fan of being touched. One thing that carries over from comics to screen is Frenchie, or the Frenchman in the comics, connection to the female. In the comics, however, he shares even more in common with her, notably Compound V enhanced strength to facilitate his head cracking ways. Just as Frenchie in the show has started to question the lifestyle he's been leading under Butcher, the Frenchman toys with pacifism after being involved with some soul shaking violence. When that doesn't stop the soul shaking violence, he instead decides to go all in. In fact, when angry or provoked, he becomes just as brutal as anyone else even if the acts disturb him when he comes down off that angry high. One of the reasons presented as to why Homelander is such a mess in the series is the all kinds of questionable relationship with Madeline Stilwell, who acts as a surrogate mother to the lab-raised man-child with an extra creepy dose of an Oedipus complex. As the only person on Earth Homelander has any degree of affection for, she uses that influence to aim Homelander at any problem that needs an unhinged superpower being to solve. There is no Madeline Stilwell in the comics. Instead, there's a James Stilwell, where Madeline operated in a Machiavellian wheels within wheels, understanding of manipulating power both politically and as a corporation, James Stilwell is more willing to take on big moves. Things like sacrificing the G-teams to protect Vought. Most notably though, in his role in overthrowing the government by aiming soups at the leadership. Madeline won't have a chance to do that in the series, of course. She became a victim of Homelander's wrath when he finds out that she's been hiding his son from him. With the success of Chris Evans' portrayal of Steve Rogers, aka Captain America, it's hard to imagine that translating that character to live action has been littered with less than stellar attempts. Two awkward TV movies were released in 1979 including highlights like a motorcycle helmet adorned with wings, and a shield with clear plastic stripes in place of the white ones. 1990's go at the Star Spangled Man with the plan turned out so bad that a theatrical release was cancelled and instead it snuck out as a direct-to-video movie. Ennis is on record as not particularly liking Captain America as a World War II character, noting that it was a real war fought by real people who had to slog through it, and the fantasy of a superhuman doing it in a way diminishes their sacrifice. Ennis drives that home with his depiction of the boy's version of Captain America, Soldier Boy. Butcher even echoes his creator's critique of the war superhero by casting doubt on his actual participation in World War II. And he's partially right. The soldier boy that he faces, idealistic but still so willing to please that he'll kill to impress Homelander, is actually the third to hold that title as it's been passed down from person to person. One thing all the soldier boys possessed was a lack of understanding of actual military tactics or strategy including a move that caused his first team of heroes and first iteration to be targeted by the Luftwaffen in World War II. So the soldier boy Butcher faced didn't participate in World War II, but his predecessor did, about as badly as Butcher assumed. The current Soldier Boy is both cowardly and easy to manipulate by people in power and a need to belong. It can't all be bleak, not even in a Garth Ennis story. You need at least one person whose soul isn't completely destroyed in order to demonstrate the contrast between basically every other depraved character populating the story. On the side of the soups, that beacon of faint hope is Starlight. In both the comics and the show, Starlight is the newest member of the Seven, brought up from the Miners as a member of a religious-based superhero team. While circumstances conspire to make her either explicit or participating in some horrible things, including horrible things happening to her, she more or less remains the promise that not all soups are awful. Their parents? Well, very few heroes have happy relationships with their parents, even in the rare circumstance that they survive. Starlight has the superhero equivalent of a child actor's background. 
participating in pageants and similar events as a child up until her acceptance into the Seven. Her comic book origin goes a little deeper. Her parents, as well as the doctors, were blinded by her at birth, when her blinding light powers went off immediately. Her parents were forced to give up Starlight to Vought, who had her raised by uncaring foster parents who benefited from her pageant circuit activities. The whole reason that Starlight is able to join the Seven is that the Seven had become six after the departure of Lamplighter. The reason for the departure is the same on page and screen. Lamplighter killed CIA Deputy Director Grace Mallory's grandchildren while trying to kill her. Since Vought's master plan is to get Compound V approved for military use, with all those lucrative military contracts, Lamplighter is demoted to prevent direct conflict with the CIA. This is where page and screen start to diverge. In the series, he is demoted to dealing with failed Compound V experiments at the Sage Grove Center. He had been blackmailed into helping the boys as a member of the Seven. He even gets a chance at redemption not once but twice. First, he covers for the boys, as Stormfront comes looking for them, and then he helps Wee Huey rescue Starlight after she was accused of treason and held at the Seven's headquarters. Though he does that by self-emulating to set off the fire alarms and unlock Starlight's cell. In the comics, he is beaten into a vegetative state by the Frenchman and the female before Mallory shoots him in the head. Eventually, he is discovered in a CIA search, never getting a chance at redemption. For the show, the boys have a powerful ally in Congresswoman Victoria Newman. She is responsible for the Federal Bureau of Superhuman Affairs, meant to be a check on super activity. Sort of a slightly more toothy Sokovia Accords. Like everyone in the boys, she is of course hiding a terrible secret. Primarily that she herself is a soup, who has a literal body count that was covered up by Vaught. She even ends up going on a head-popping spree that would make the crushing head guy from Kids in the Hall jealous. This, along with her past connections to Stan Edgar, leave her actual loyalties in question. How could that be worse? Well, in place of a fairly competent Victoria Newman, there's Victor, Vic the Veep Newman in the comics. Vic the Veep is a former CEO of Vought that went on to become vice president, hence the name. He is simple-minded and as depraved as Vought's primary product, superheroes, and an easy tool for political manipulation by the current heads of Vought. It's probably obvious at this point that just about everyone from the show has a comic book version turned up another notch or two, even Mother's Milk. Mother's Milk on screen has as much of a reason to hate Vought as any other member of the boys, holding Vought responsible for the death of his father through good old-fashioned corporate malfeasance and lawyers. Like the series Frenchie, he's not powered, at least not yet, and is frequently looking for ways to give up the life, though he admits that he has the revenge disease. In the pages of the comics, he is a result of Compound V, giving him strength and endurance and a reason for being called Mother's Milk. It turns out that he needs his mother's milk to survive. In the series, his relationship with his wife, then ex-wife, is strained because of the danger his life puts them in. In the comics, the mother of Mother's Milk's child, say that five times fast, is a drug addict, and M.M. struggles to support her and dedicate himself to his vengeance-filled lifestyle. So it's not so much to say that he's worse, but his circumstances are. Oh, and his power is disturbing. Yeah, even poor wee Huey gets a dark upgrade when put in print. Huey, like Starlight for the Seven, represents the outsider view into the wackadoo world of superheroes, and the people who put superheroes in check. His job is to acknowledge that yes, this is in fact bonkers. Comic book and live action Huey both have a relationship with Starlight, but in the comics for most of the time, they have no idea what the other does. In the show, Huey is often pressed to use and manipulate his relationship with the well-meaning Starlight for leverage on the Seven, often putting her in direct danger from the increasingly unhinged Homelander. Which seems bad. But Comic Huey can't escape the halo of violence and brutality that surrounds the boys, and ends up having his hands in more than a few untimely deaths, from punching through a member of Teenage Kicks on his first mission, to kicking A-Train's head off after trying to spare the soup responsible for killing his girlfriend. How could the evil corporation behind the soups and all their manipulations be worse than the Vought International of the live-action series? Well, through total incompetence, mostly. While the Vought International is a well-connected, diabolically manipulative, and carefully controlling information and the narrative, in the comics Vought American is a company on the brink before discovering Compound V through Project Paperclip, and is barely able to control their heroes or their image. In fact, James Stilwell actually goes mad when his perfectionist nature encounters how sloppily Vought American is, particularly when it comes to signature product Compound V. It's easy for some characters to be worse in the comics by way of them barely showing up in the series. The most notable version is that of Butcher's English Bulldog, Terror. Terror gets little more than a cameo in Season 1 and 2. In the comics, he's a constant companion of Butcher, more than willing to step into the fray, including taking a bite out of the Crimson Countess. His chief move is hinted at in the series. Butcher has trained him to, uh, get intimate with the soups that the boys fight. It's something live-action Terror demonstrates on a Homelander toy. 
Really, we've only scratched the surface of some of the messed up things that the boys and the soups have gotten up to in the pages of the comics, because there just isn't a delicate way to mention them in this video. But that's part of the fun of a Garth Ennis comic book.